up through that. College. Thank you, Senator Grogan. The time for two-minute statements has expired. It's time for question time. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. The, the, <laughs> I'm out of practice. Stop interjecting. Um, the, the Prime Minister said in April, and I quote, I'll say this very clearly, they, Australians, will be better off under a Labor government, end quote. Minister, with inflation rising by 1.8 per cent to 6.1 per cent for the year to June quarter and Labor's policy to reduce power bills by $275 already dumped, is it not true that Australians can buy less when they shop for groceries and pay off less of their mortgages. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Uh, Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I welcome the opportunity to talk about Labor's economic plan to deal with the, to deal with uh, the economic. Minister, resume your seat. I'm going to wait for quiet, and then the minister can continue. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I welcome the opportunity to talk about Labor's economic plan to deal with the economic challenges that we inherited after nine years of failed policies and wrong priorities. And that is the truth, uh, President. Order. These are the circumstances we inherited. Before the Senator election, McGrath. inflation was rising, interest rates were increasing, yep. supply chain disruption was occurring yep. because there had been yep. no investment in skills. Yep. The energy market, the, the energy market was in resume your seat. <clears throat> Uh, Senator Cash, uh, senators, interjections across the chamber are disorderly on both sides. Uh, Senator Henderson, I'm calling the chamber to order. It's not a debating point; it's a request. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much, President. We inherited an energy market in crisis, increasing power prices that were actively hidden by the member for Hume on the eve of Senator an election McGrath. being called, actually changed the code so that that information couldn't be made public. That is what we inherited, and Labor's economic plan is going to deal with all of these challenges. So, In, in answer to your questions about will households uh, be better off, they will be better off with our investment in childcare. Oh, I hate hearing about these uh, things. Thank you. Senator Rustin. Uh, on a point of order, um, the, uh, the minister just repeated an accusation that was made uh, on, on, on uh, misleading the Senate. Uh, um, Senator the, Rustin, the... please resume your seat. That is a debating point. Minister Wong, thank you. I'm going to call uh, Minister Gallagher. Thank you very much. Households will be better off with the policies that Labor are implementing. Cheaper childcare. I can go through them again, and I'll do it all through question time. Every single question, I'll give Order. you the same answer. Cost of living relief for families. Cheaper childcare to reduce costs for more than $1.2 million Senator families. McGrath. Cheaper medicines. Taking the speed limit off the economy with better training for our workforce, for free TAFE places, for investing in cleaner Minister and Gallagher, cheaper energy. Your seat. I need to be able to hear the minister's response, and I'm finding it difficult when there, is, there are so many loud interjections. I would ask senators to be quiet, particularly those on my left. Minister Gallagher. Creating a future made in Australia with the National Reconstruction Fund, growing the care economy, upgrading the NBN, and I know I'll have further opportunity to expand on Thank this. Thank you, um, Minister. Um, Senator Brockman, first supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. The Prime Minister has said, my government has a policy of doing what we can do to assist cost of living pressures. My question is this, what will the government do now? prior to the October budget for Australians who are having to do more with less. Uh, Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much. And um, we will do what we said we'd do, and what we've already done is provide support for people affected by floods. We've extended the hospital right. funding and pandemic leave. We've yep. successfully yep. argued for a minimum wage case. We've announced yeah. the job and skills yeah. government. We've oh, begun oh, the oh. review into the Reserve Bank. We've what begun the program. audit of rorts and waste, going through the budget line by line to see what you were all Minister, up to. Minister, We've begun all that. Minister We've Gallagher, resume your seat. 
As senators on both sides of the chamber, I am not able to hear the minister's answer. I would ask you, Senator Brown, I would ask you to be silent. Minister Gallagher, please continue. Thank you. We've introduced the climate change legislation that will kickstart more investment in, the, in renewables and grow jobs and opportunities. And in relation to the budget, we are going through your budget that we inherited line by line because after nine years of Order. wrong policies, failed policies and Mr. wrong Gallagher, priorities. Resume your seat. Uh, Minister Watt. Uh, thank you. On my right, you need to be quiet and allow the minister the opportunity to answer the question. Just because you don't like the answer, there is no need for any senators on either side to be disorderly. Please continue, Minister Gallagher. We are working to repair the budget and put downward pressure on $1 trillion of Liberal debt. Uh, Senator Brockman, second supplementary. Minister. The price of groceries is increasing. Power prices are increasing. Mortgage repayments are increasing. Does this government have any policies at all that will address these issues right now, or will the minister admit that Australians are not better off? Another broken Labor promise. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Well, Australian households will be better off from a government that's actually focused on improving, improve, or introducing policies that deal with these issues over the longer term, rather than this, what we had after you, uh, under you, which was nine years of political short-term fixes to get you through a news cycle, not actually to deal with the significant challenges Minister in the economy. Gallagher. I'll finish there. Thank you. Uh, Senator Grogan. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. Can the minister outline the current state of the Australian energy market and its consequences for Australians? Minister Wong. Thank you, uh, President, and thank you to Senator Grogan for the question and for your interest in how this is affecting Australians and Australian families. And the reality is that Australians are feeling the pain in their hip pocket because of nine years of denial, exactly. nine years of chaos, nine years of failed energy policies, as well as the significant international factors. Uh, international Wong. factors uh, that, have been, uh, that we Minister are experiencing, Wong. and you don't like it, do you? Minister you don't Wong. like it, do you? You don't Minister like the facts. Wong. Interjections and yelling out at the top of your voice is absolutely inappropriate and disorderly. To the point, order, order. To the point when I tried to establish quiet, none of you could hear me. Now it is disorderly. It's your question time. That's your opportunity that to ask questions that's being uh, interfered with. But the level of noise has to be reduced, Minister Wong. Thank you. Yes, the impact from the former government's lack of energy policy is being felt across the economy by Australian families and businesses. Skyrocketing wholesale electricity prices, putting pressure on budgets. They promised a gas-led recovery, and you had a gas crisis. And renewables, the cheapest form of energy, Minister declined Wong. under you. Minister Wong. Minister Wong, please resume. Uh, the fact is, the lack of policy certainty, the lack of any policy framework, the chaos. You know what it did? It stifled investment. It stifled investment. It slowed the uptake of renewables. And instead of being well placed to deal with this challenge, Australians were left vulnerable by Wong, a government that had 22 energy policies. Your seat. Seriously, it's not only disorderly; it's disrespectful. And I will keep sitting the minister down for as long as it takes because it's your time that's being wasted. Thank you, Senator McGrath. Calling out like that is completely disorderly. Minister Wong. Thank you. 
Well, they might not like to recall how a market operates, but let me tell you this. Your chaos stifled investment. Right. Three, nine years, 22 energy policies. You took oh, four Minister gigawatts Wong. out of the— Minister Wong, please resume your seat. Senator Hen— oh, I'll call you when it's quiet. Minister, oh, Senator Henderson. Um, Madam President, thank you. Could I ask if you could ask the senator to direct her comments through the chair? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Wong. President, they took four gigawatts of capacity out of the system, they put one in, and then they wonder why that has contributed to the price increases that Australians are experiencing. Then they come in here, Madam Pre Mr. Pre Pre President, they come here and they say, oh, oh, it's really bad. Well, maybe you should have thought of that in the nine years you were in government. The nine years you were in government, Australians Thank are paying you, the Minister price. Thank you, Minister Wong. Your time has expired. Uh, Second, a uh, first supplementary. Thank you. Oh, beg your pardon. Sorry. Uh, uh, Madam President, um, Senator Wong has continued to refer to you uh, in her contribution. Could I ask you to again remind her that she's to refer, that she's to um, make her comments through the chair and not directed at the chair. Thank you. Uh, Senator Henderson, it is quite appropriate for anyone in the chamber to refer to me as president. Uh, uh, meaning Senator the coalition. Henderson, that's not a point so of order. She, Thank you. Please use she, the yeah, yeah. Uh, Senator, Senator Henderson, I'm not accepting that it's a point of order, so please resume your seat. Yes. Senator, Thank you, Senator Henderson. First supplementary, Senator Grogan. Um, Can the minister now uh, outline— Senator Grogan, so, please resume your seat. Senator Henderson. I just um, respectfully ask that you review um, your, your sure. order then I'll review it and make, come yep, back to the chamber absolutely. tomorrow. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Resume your seat. Minister Wong. On the point of order, well, we can get the president all the time to keep reviewing. I think the president thought that you were talking about the president. I understood, and now I think it is clarified, that you feel sensitive about me calling you you. So I am supposed to call you the opposition, leader, correct? I will attempt to do so, Thank President. You, and it is, it is correct. It is correct that it is consistent with the standing orders. I would make the point that everybody who stood here in the nine years I've been here has used the word you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Grogan. Uh, thank you for that first answer. Can the minister now outline what action the Albanese government is taking to secure Australia's energy future? Our minister Wong. Thank you. Well, we are getting on with the job. We're working with industry to invest in the technology our nation needs to secure supply to power the future and drive down emissions. I mean, it is extraordinary, President, that a party that pretends to understand markets refuses to take responsibility of the mess they've made of the market. And the mess they've made of the market is one primary reason, one primary Order. reason why we see price increases. Order. And you're right, their only response to price increases was to hide them. Was to hide them. That's been their only response. We are giving AEMO more powers to address projected gas shortages and other challenges in the electricity Minister market. Wong. We progress. Minister Wong, please resume your seat. Minister Wong, please continue. We are progressing a capacity market with states to ensure we have reliable supplies and supply, and through the National Energy Transition Agreement, we are delivering energy policy to support investment. And importantly, we are implementing the Powering Australian Plan that Australians voted for. Thank you, Minister Australia Wong. The time has expired. Um, order, order. Uh, Senator Grogan, please resume your seat. Did you have a Senate? Um, I'm, we're not up to you yet. Um, I thought you were calling a point of order. Senator Grogan, second supplementary. Um, can the minister outline what the impact of hiding this information from Australians is on the state of the energy market? Minister Wong. Minister Wong, please resume your seat. Um, Senator Rustin. On a point of order, um, standing order 193.3, um, the, uh, the questioner and several ministers on the other side have continuously referred to an action by the previous minister 
um, and suggested that he tried to hide uh, and, and a number of other assertions along that. Um, that is an adverse reflection on somebody in the other place and suggesting that he did. Uh, the minister would, uh, did not do that. Um, the matter Sen that uh, Senator Rustin, uh, it's not a reflection on the minister. Please resume your seat. I'm, it's not a point of order. Uh, I've asked no because you're debating the you're you're debating the point. It is not a point of order. Please resume your seat. Do you have a point of order, yes, Senator Scar? The lines. No, and I'm, if it's on the same matter, I've ruled on it. So well, I'm President, not gonna... it's a it's a different matter, okay. and that is imputation of an improper motive. No, I'm sorry, which is different from a personal reflection. I don't accept the point of order. Minister, please continue. Uh, uh, well, uh, on, uh, on the point of order, if I may, uh, Minister. Uh, <laughs> President. Sorry, President. Uh, I think we, the word was hiding, not lied. Oh, okay. Dear me. Okay. Senator, thank, thank, sorry. Senator Cash. Thank you, President. And after listening carefully to the various comments that have been made, uh, I would request that, given there does seem to be some confusion, you do review the Hansard, what was said, and then come back to the chamber tomorrow with a ruling. Thank you, um, Senate Order. Senator, Senator Cash, I did hear the words that Senator Rustin uh, referred to, which was hiding. Uh, I took advice from the clerk, uh, but um, if it satisfies the Senate, I'm more than happy to review uh, the Hansard. Thank you, Senator Rustin. I'm not entertaining any further points of order on this matter, so if it's a new point of order, I'm happy to hear it. Order in relation to the request that's before you at the moment in terms of reviewing uh, the particular um, information that I would seek for you to also review comments that have been made by others, including Senator Gallagher and Senator Watt, um, on the same matter. Um, Senator Rustin, you're well aware that you can't take a retrospective point of order. I've agreed to review the Hansard and come back to the Senate. Um, I Minister Wong. The point of order and ask them to withdraw. Our uh, order, Senator, Senator um, Wong, please ask, thank you. continue with the question asked by the second supplementary asked S by Senator S Brogan. Thank you. Well, uh, transparency when it comes to markets is important. Transparency when it comes to elections is important. And what we what we know what we know is that the member for Hume, the former industry minister. Uh, saw a 19.7 per cent increase to the default market offer and amended the industry code for Senator electricity McGrath. retailers on 6 uh, April. Minister Wong, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Rustin. On a point of order, um, in relation to um, the, uh, making an, uh, a reflection on somebody in the other place for an action that they did not take. Um, that is a debating point, Senator Rustin, but to be perfectly honest, there were so many interjections, particularly from the right, I was struggling to hear Minister Wong. And once again, I would ask Senator McGrath, Senator McGrath, from the left. Um, Minister Wong, please continue. The member for Hume amended the industry code for electricity retailers four days before the election um, was called to delay Minister the re Wong. release of increases. Minister Wong, please resume your seat. Minister Wong. Senator Rustin. On a point of order, in terms of reflecting on a member in the other place, the minister in responding to the question is making an accusation of inappropriate behaviour by the member for Hume, which she has no evidence of. Rustin, once again, that is a debating point. Minister Wong, please continue. Thank you. Uh, and the, the effect of the actions of the member for Hume delayed the release of increases in the default market offer for New South Wales, Queensland and South Australia until after the election. Until after, and no amount of point of order or interjection can hide the fact that what is occurring in the energy market is as a consequence of your chaos, and your only response was to try and hide it until after the election. So don't come in here and go on about electricity prices. We know who the guilty Thank party you, is. Thank you, Minister Wong. Your time has expired. Senator Scar. Thank you, President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Senator Watt. 
Minister, last week the federal court fined the CFMMEU and two officials in our home state of Queensland more than $150,000 for entry breaches, thuggish behaviour and disgusting homophobic slurs on the $5.4 billion Queensland Cross River Rail project. Will the minister, will the minister guarantee that by abolishing the Australian Building and Construction Commission, this disgraceful and disgusting behaviour will not become even more prevalent on construction sites in Queensland and across this nation. Thank you, Good Senator question. Scar. Minister Watt. Thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Scar, for the question. As Senator Scar knows, I have the utmost respect for our judiciary and our judicial institutions, and it's not for me to uh, criticise any decisions that they have made. Uh, however, 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 the uh, I remind what what I note what I note what I note. You're right there, uh, Senator Watt. What I note, what I note, is that in the second week of the sittings of this parliament, the, the shadow minister for employment and workplace relations has been ruled out of asking questions about the ABCC or anything to do with Senator it because Watt, of her own uh, record minister in Watt, that portfolio. Minister Watt. Senator Cash. The order is pretty obvious. It is in relation to relevance. The question that was asked by Senator Carr was in relation to the imposition scar was in relation to the imposition of a fine on the CFMEU, mm -hmm. as he has stated, for certain behaviour, including disgusting yes, homophobic flirts. The question, Senator the Carr, question Senator is very Cash. narrow in terms of will the minister guarantee that by abolishing the ABCC mm -hmm. this type of behaviour will not become more prevalent? Thank you, uh, Senator Cash. I have listened carefully to Minister Watt. Uh, the question was broadly about um, decisions of a court, behaviours of union and so on and so forth. I do believe that the minister is being relevant and I will listen carefully to the rest of his, uh, the rest of his answer. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. Uh, of course, this government thinks that it is unacceptable behaviour in any workplace to see thuggish behaviour, to see homophobic slurs, uh, whether that be on a construction work site or, frankly, in a parliamentary workplace. And maybe people could all reflect on that as well. Uh, but the comments made by uh, judges in the particular case that Senator Scar was referring to are not the only comments that we've heard made by the judiciary about the ABCC. To take one example, Justice North in the federal court blasted the ABCC for wasting time and taxpayers' money on prosecuting two CFMMEU officials Senator for having McGrath. a cup of tea with a mate. Justice North criticised the ABCC, saying this is a, quote, minuscule, insignificant Senator affair. Watt. Uh, Minister Watt, please resume your seat. Uh, Minister Watt, please continue. Uh, thank you. Uh, Senator Ka Senate Senator Scar. Catching. I know. Uh, President, at point of order relevance, uh, Senator Watt is providing other judicial comments in relation to the ABCC. He's not dealing specifically with my question in relation to whether or not the abolition of the ABCC— yep. Thank you, Senator Scar. There is no need to repeat the question. Uh, and once again, uh, Minister Watt— Minister Watt is being relevant. He is talking about behaviour of uh, a whole range of people, including unions. He's condemned the behaviour, and I would ask him to continue. Thank you, Minister Watt. Thank you, President. As I was saying, there have been numerous cases in which the ABCC has been criticised by judges. Uh, we, in ABCC against Parker, Justice Kerr criticised the ABCC for over-egging its case, being a battleship in uh, full steam Watt, which had difficulty turning. Please resume your seat. Senator McGrath, every time your voice gets very loud, I am simply going to sit down whoever has got the call. And that means that time is being wasted uh, by your actions in this question time. Thank you, Minister Watt. Thank you, President. I was reflecting on the irony of certain opposition members asking questions about thuggish behaviour when they continue to disrespect your ruling. The, it, so, as I say, there are numerous cases in which judges over time. Uh, Minister Watt, your time has expired. Senator Scar, first supplementary. Minister, the judge noted in his judgment that he had previously described the CFMMEU as the quote 
greatest recidivist offender in Australian corporate history, end quote, and that no other penalty than the maximum penalty was appropriate. Will the minister specifically, specifically condemn the homophobic slurs and thuggish behaviour of the CFME officials that led to this fine? Specifically condemn those CFMEU officials Thank you, for Senator the conduct? Scar, the time for asking the question has expired. Minister Watt. Well, I think we're already at tedious repetition in question three for the day. I have already said that there is no place for thuggish behaviour, homophobic behaviour or any other uh, outrageous behaviour in a Order. workplace. Order. So, I mean, I've got a whole list of comments from the judiciary about the ABB, ABCC, which I can run through if you want me to. Uh, I didn't finish what Justice North had to say uh, about Minister the ABCC. Watt, please resume your Thank seat. you. Uh, Senator Brockman. We're on direct relevance. The minister is clearly indicating he is about to go off a very narrow, very direct question. He is flagging it in advance. Uh, thank you, Senator You should bring Brockman. him back to the question. Thank you, Senator Brockman. I believe the minister is being relevant. He has referred to the union in question, and I will listen carefully to the remainder of his comments. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. Here's a bit more about what Justice North had to say about the ABCC. For goodness sake, I don't know minister what this Watt, inspectorate is doing. Minister resume your seat. Senator Brockman, I'm not going to entertain a point of order because it's the same point of order you just made. Please resume your seat. I indicated that I would listen to the minister's answer. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. All I can do is repeat the comments that I've made twice already in answer to the primary question and the first su supplementary, which is that there is no place for thuggish behaviour, homophobic slurs in any workplace, intimidation. Uh, that is not appropriate on a construction website, uh, work site. It is not appropriate in a parliamentary website. Hello, Senator McGrath. Uh, and thank it is not you, appropriate Minister. in any Your other work site. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Scar, second supplementary. Uh, thank you, President. The judge also noted that the penalty would still be insufficient to deter the CFMMEU as they regard such a sum as chump change. Will the government commit to at least doubling the fines available to the courts for such matters, including the disgraceful matters considered in this case, as the coalition government promised to do in April this year? Will you commit to that? Thank you, Senator Scar. Minister Watt. Well, thank you, Senator Scar, for reminding us of something that your government had nine years available to do and didn't actually do until its dying days in, uh, in, in government. Uh, and thank you again for reminding us that Senator Cash apparently has been ruled out from asking any questions in the portfolio that she's the shadow minister in. The, the, it, it is interesting that we continue to see members of the opposition uh, talk up the ABCC when Senator its record Abbott was about prosecuting trivial matters, uh, going after unions, going after workers, rather than actually doing anything to minister improve what? the lot of workers or in the industry. I'll just wait for quiet uh, Senator Scar before I come to you, Senator Scar. A point of order, President. It was a very specific supplementary question about whether or not the government would double the fines or not. Yes or no answer. It should be perfectly able to be delivered on that sort of question. Uh, thank you, Senator Scar. Minister Wong. On the point of order, I mean th these are getting spurious. Uh, the minister responded on the subject matter, which was fines. Uh, and if the opposition wish to chew up question time by taking ongoing points of order on spurious grounds, it's a matter for them. But I put to you, President, that there is no point of order in the point of order that's just made made. Thank you, uh, Minister Wong. Uh, thank you, um, Senator Scar. The minister is being relevant. I can't direct him. Uh, he may not be giving the answer you require, and I can't direct him to directly answer your question, but he is being relevant to the subject matter of the question. Minister Watt, uh, Minister Watt please continue. Thank you, President. Senator Scar knows very well the policy we took to the election in relation to the ABCC, and that was to abolish it. And the reason we intend to abolish it is that it has been a gross waste of taxpayers' money prosecuting minor issues involving workplaces, workers and unions, and it has done nothing whatsoever to deal with the labour productivity issues that exist in the industry. For all the opposition's uh, talk about the ABCC, productivity you, has Minister fallen Watt, on construction your time websites. Has expired. Uh, Senator McKim. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Minister, in just a minute or two, the RBA will announce a further increase in interest rates. 
Last week, the Treasurer said that these interest rate, cut, interest rate increases will result in higher unemployment and further cuts to real wages. Workers, renters and recent home buyers are being smashed to try and bring down inflation that is being driven by supply shocks and corporate profiteering. Minister, is the government seriously suggesting that there is no alternative? In 2022, is there really no better way for government bodies to respond to the current bout of inflation in a way that would cause less pain for Australians? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, President. I thank uh, Senator McKim for the questions, uh, or question and the two that will follow. Um, the government supports the independence of the Reserve Bank and its responsibility around um, setting monetary policy. Uh, we are in a highly inflationary environment, uh, and that is placing pressure on interest rates, um, which are rising, and we have seen those rises over the last few months, uh, and the decision will be made public uh, probably right now while I'm on my feet. Um, and we, uh, in terms of uh, our approach to that, accepting that the RBA has responsibility for monetary policy and to um, keep or to target inflation within that two to three per, uh, percent band, uh, and then the government has responsibility for fiscal policy. Uh, and well, thank you, Senator Rennick. Minister, well, if you're so smart, Senator why Rennick. are you sitting over there on the back bench? You know. Um, it's even more important. The government's view is it's even more important that we are implementing the policies we took to the election, which is uh, accepting that there are some parts of the inflation problem that are being driven by international um, effects. That there are things that we should be doing here to make those sensible investments into the productive side of the economy to deal with some of those supply constraints that over the longer term will grow the economy and put downward pressure on the cost of living. That is the plan we took to the election. That is the plan we are going to implement. And we accept that these interest rate rises are difficult on households, and we constantly look at ways that we can manage some of those impacts on households in the future, including as we approach uh, the, budget the budget process in October. Uh, accepting that we are going through the budget line by line to make sure that every Thank dollar you, spent Minister is Gallagher. quality. A, second sup a first supplementary, um, Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I note, uh, Minister, the announcement is that interest rates are up by 50 basis points. Uh, profits are at record highs, and wages' share of national income is at record lows. The European Central Bank has identified that corporate profits are surging on the back of the recent increase in inflation. Will you finally accept that corporate profiteering is contributing to inflation in Australia? Thank you, Senator McKim. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, uh, President. And, uh, I understand that this is the strong view of um, the Greens' political party, and it's one that they have been arguing. Um, I do, uh, and I have said, and I said last week, that our priority when it comes to tax reform, which is what Senator McKim alludes to, uh, is to focus on multinational tax reform and ensuring that multinationals pay their fair share of tax, and that will contribute uh, to budget repair. Um, and we do want to we do want to get wages moving. We do think there's a social licence attached uh, to uh, some of the companies that have been doing pretty well in the last uh, few months. Uh, but our focus is on repairing the budget, making those sensible investments into the economy, dealing with some of those supply constraints, getting wages moving, investing for the long-term productive side of the economy. That is what we said we'd do before the election. That's what we're doing after. Thank you, Minister. Senator McKim, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Two weeks ago, Minister, the Prime Minister warned the RBA against overreaching. Corporates Corporate super profit taxes would help rein in inflation and lessen the likelihood of the RBA overreaching. Why won't the government introduce corporate super profits taxes to rein in inflation and help fund cost of living relief such as free childcare and dental and mental health into Medicare? Thank you, Senator McKim. Um, Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Well, uh, to my first point is the Prime Minister didn't warn 
uh, the Reserve Bank. Uh, I think the Prime Minister referred to the difficult balance that the Reserve Bank uh, has to navigate in this inflationary environment and the decisions they take about um, increasing interest rates that were occurring in this environment, I would like to say, was occurring before the election. Uh, and these uh, interest rates, while they're hard on households, uh, when you've got inflation at, at the levels that we've got it, uh, you will see rising interest rates. In, re in, in respect to the second part of Senator McKim's question, this is asking, will the Labor government implement the Green political party's um, commitments that they took to the election or made after that? And the answer to that, as I said last week, is we are implementing we are implementing the policies that we took to the election, uh, and that's what we said we'd do before, and it's what we're doing after. Thank you, Minister Gallagher. Senator Billick. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Can the Minister update the Senate on the Reserve Bank's decision moments ago in relation to interest rate? Um, thank you, President. I, I thank Senator Billick uh, for the question, and it's an important question that affects uh, all of us, and many Australians, particularly those with mortgages, but also those with savings accounts. The Independent Reserve Bank has made its decision today to increase interest rates by another 50 basis points, bringing the cash rate to 1.85 per cent. Now, Australians knew that this was coming, but it doesn't make it any easier to handle. The cycle of rate rises commenced before the election in response to the inflationary pressures that emerged before the election. Average homeowners owing $330,000 will have to find about $90 a month more for repayments, on top of the $220 extra in repayments since early May. For Australians with a typical $500,000 mortgage, it's an extra $140 a month, in addition to the extra $335 they've had to find since early May. Now, this won't come as a surprise to many, but it, is, it's, um, it will still be a shock to many households. Families will have to make more hard decisions about how to balance the household budget in the face of pressures like higher grocery prices and how higher power prices, which the member for Hume kept hidden from them prior to the election. As a government, we are focusing on um, the economic plan we took to the election campaign that it makes the sensible investments into childcare, into skills, into digital services, using the National Reconstruction Fund, making uh, childcare cheaper and lowering the price of energy through uh, the Powering Australia plan. These are the commitments that we made in the election. These are the commitments we will do, uh, and we will monitor all of these um, in their lead up to the October budget uh, and the decisions we take about there, which will be primarily about fixing the waste and rorts um, of the previous government and implementing the election commitments that we took. Thank you, Minister Gallagher. Senator Billett, first supplementary. Thank you. And thank you for that answer, Minister. Can the Minister update the Senate on how this decision might impact Australians with savings accounts? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, President, and I thank Senator Billick for the supplementary. Obviously, higher interest rates primarily affect mortgage holders, but there's also an impact on savers as well. As the Treasurer pointed out earlier today, he's found, in, he's found it disappointing. Uh, that higher interest rates weren't necessarily being passed on to savers and that he would raise this directly with the banks. And I'm sure that those opposite would support that approach. The Treasurer has said that savers have been the principal victims of interest rates when they've been incredibly low and that they should be the beneficiaries of rising interest rates. He said they've been doing it for tough for some time now and it's time that they got a bit of relief and the government certainly supports that approach. Thank you, Minister Gallagher. Second supplementary, Senator Billick. Thank you, President. Can the minister update the Senate on how the government's plans will support Australians during this challenging economic period? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I thank Senator Billick for the supplementary. Australians knew that the problems like high and rising inflation have been made worse by a decade of wasted opportunities and wrong priorities and those opposite. The Albanese government's economic plan is a direct response to the economic challenges that we face right now. Responsible cost of living relief, cheap of childcare, cheaper medicines, addressing the supply side inflationary challenges and taking the speed limit off the economy, like investing in skills and productivity, cleaner and cheaper energy—get that one, Senator Henderson. 
getting wages moving again and beginning the very difficult work of budget repair so that the trillion dollars of Liberal debt doesn't grow bigger and bigger for generations to come. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator David Pocock. Thank you, President. My question is to, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Housing, Senator Farrell. This week is National Homelessness Week, which draws attention to the over 100,000 people who experience homelessness tonight and every night this week. In places like the ACT, the dangers of homelessness, especially for rough sleepers, are particularly acute in winter. Could the minister provide an update on progress in the development of the promised national housing strategy? Uh, minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, President. And uh, I thank uh, <coughs> Senator uh, Pocock for his uh, question. Uh, which is um, obviously a um, very serious issue, uh, not uh, just in the ACT, uh, which he uh, referred to, but ac across the country. And um, of course, um, what uh, the Labor Party uh, has inherited after uh, nine years of neglect on this, uh, on this uh, subject matter, of course, is a very serious uh, situation. Um, <coughs> And of course, the decision today by the Reserve Bank to increase uh, interest rates uh, certainly uh, hasn't made uh, that uh, that issue any easier to uh, to deal with. Um, be, I I'm quite. Th thanks for that uh, um, intervention. Minister thanks Farrell, for that. Direct your questions to the chair, please. I'm quite capable of answering the question uh, without any support, particularly from you. Um, <laughs> Um, but look, 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 Order. look there's, a, there's a serious issue here. Senator Pocock has raised a serious uh, issue, and I'd like, I'd like to—well, I, I have been answering it. I have Minister been answering Farrell, it. please um, direct your questions to the Sorry. president, not across the chamber. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, but what we've seen is uh, a legacy of inaction on the part of the uh, previous government. Um, and uh, it's the intention of this government to... Um oh, I beg your pardon, Senator Lambie. Sorry. Point of relevance. Um, that's nice to go and blame the government for the last all that time you've chewed up. But I think that, uh, with all due respect to Senator Pocock, if you could just answer his question, that would be wonderful. Thank, thank you. You, you can go and play all the games you like. Thank you, like Senator Lambie. Um, I'll remind uh, the minister of the question. Are you seeking a point of order, Senator Pocock? I'd repeat the question. No, the question doesn't need to be repeated. Okay. Thank you. Minister Farrell. Now, in stark contrast to what uh, the opposition uh, did in, uh, in its time in government, Australia, Australia, Australia has finally uh, got a government Thank in you, Canberra. Thank you, Minister Farrell. Your time has expired. Um, Senator Pocock, first supplementary. Thanks. Uh, my last question was an update on the progress in the development of the promised national housing strategy. The first supplementary is about the commitment to build 30,000 new social and affordable homes over the next year. Noting the urgency of this task, when can we expect to see enabling legislation introduced and construction to actually start? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Pocock for his first uh, supplementary uh, question. Um, I, I think um, we should start by sort of pointing out that uh, one of the first things that the Albanese government did uh, when they came to power was, for the first time, uh, incorporate uh, <coughs> into cabinet the position of uh, housing and uh, homelessness. Yeah. So you're asking a question about what, what are we planning to do? Well, I'd start by um, by suggesting that uh, the decision to put um, the, uh, that portfolio into cabinet is, is, um, is a very good start in dealing with these uh, serious issues. Um, now, we've got a very uh, significant and a very strong reform agenda. You have mentioned some of the projects that we're uh, planning to, uh, to implement. Um, well, we've been in, we've been in government Two months. Thank you, Two Minister months. Farrell. Your time has expired. Senator Pocock, second supplementary. 
Thank you, Senator Farrell. Order. <laughs> Order. Will the government consider wiping the historic $100 million ACT housing debt, as it has previously done for Tasmania and South Australia, to immediately free up funds that can be invested in building more social housing? Minister Farrell. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank, um, thank Senator Pocock for his uh, supplementary, uh, supplementary question. Um, that particular issue, of course, is not uh, an issue uh, in the uh, purview of the uh, Minister for, uh, for Housing. Of course, it's um, an issue uh, for the, uh, for the uh, Treasurer uh, to deal with. Um, um, but, but I'm very happy to have a chat to him about that issue, and I'll come back to you with a response. Thank you. Senator Nampajinka Price. <coughs> Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Indigenous Australians, Senator Gallagher. Last night on the ABC's Q&A program, the Minister for Indigenous Australians, Linda Burney, stated that Labor plans to ingrain a body likened to ATSIC in the Constitution. Given the failure of ATSIC to improve the outcomes, opportunities and hopes of Indigenous people in areas of health, education and employment, and the fact Labor supported the abolition of ATSIC, why is the Minister for Indigenous Australians using ATSIC as the basis for the Labor Party's model? Thank you, Senator. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much, um, President. I thank Senator Price for the, um, the question. And I would begin by acknowledging the huge amount of work uh, that the Minister for Indigenous Affairs, assisted uh, by Senator Malandiri McCarthy and Senator Dodson, have done uh, in uh, supporting the Prime Minister and the announcement he made uh, on Saturday about uh, progressing a referendum and a voice, uh, treaty and truth. Um, this is a period of time, and certainly we, we discussed it this morning in our party room, of enormous pride uh, to get behind and build momentum uh, to amend the constitution with a referendum. Um, Minister, please resume your seat. Senator, uh, Senator Catch. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, Madam President, with all due respect to Senator Gallagher, Senator Nambajimba Price's question was very very clear. It was in relation to comments made by the Minister on ATSIC and why the Minister for Indigenous Australians is using ATSIC as the basis for the Labor Party's model. It wasn't about the work that had been done to date. It wasn't about oh, anything you, yet Senator that Cash. Senator Gallagher uh, is Senator referring Watt. to. <coughs> was the voice the Minister is relevant? Uh, order. Order. Senator Nampajinka's The minister is relevant, Thank you. and I'd ask the senator to withdraw. Minister Wong, that please is a reflection on the. Um, minister. Thank you, Senator Brockman. I, I wish to just add on the point of order. I, I'm, I, I've just reviewed the question and it had no mention thank, of the voice. Thank had you. No Senator mention Brockman, of the voice, please, Madam President. Senator Brockman, please resume your seat. I'm about to rule on the uh, point of order. I listen very carefully. Order. I listened very carefully to the question. It was broad ranging. It did talk about Q and A. It talked about ATSIC. It talked about the health and welfare of First Nations peoples in this country. Um, I've listened carefully to uh, Minister Gallagher, who's um, still got a minute 15 to go, and uh, if she is not addressing the question, I will draw it to her attention. Uh, thank you, Minister Gallagher. Thank you, Madam President. And I didn't see um, the minister's comments, but I, I know the minister well and have had many conversations with her about this, as I have with many of my colleagues on this uh, side of the chamber. Um, and the point, I think, of uh, the discussions that we've been having since the Prime Minister's uh, address on Saturday was really about progressing um, constitutional recognition for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that has been worked on for many, many years. 
And um, Minister, please resume your seat, Senator Cash. Uh, President, with all due respect, yet again the question was very, very clear. It was in relation to comments about ATSIC and why the Minister for Indigenous Australians is using ATSIC as the basis for the Labor Party model. I would put it to you, and, and I may have to request that you do have a look at your rulings, the mere mention of a word in a question does not enable thank the you, minister to refer Senator, to that particular thank you. word as thank the answer. You, Senator Cash. I'll take advice from the clerk. Um, Senator Cash and other senators have drawn have drawn uh, Minister Gallagher back to a part of the question, and I will invite the senator to continue. I will invite the minister to, to continue answering the question. Well, thank you. As I said, I didn't hear the comments that the minister made, but I understand the approach that she and, and Senator Dodson as the special envoy are bringing and, and Senator uh, Malandiri McCarthy as assistant minister are bringing to this discussion. As the Prime Minister has said, there will be further consultation and deliberation with First Nations people and the community more broadly as we work towards the referendum. But we have been talking about this for 15 years. We want the debate around it to be respectful. We want pe to bring people together on the journey and we want to get the outcome in the end. And that is what Minister Burney and all of us are working towards. Thank you, Minister. Um, Senator Nampajinka Price, first supplementary. Thank you. Again, on last night's ABC Q&A program, the Minister for Indigenous Australians, Linda Burney, stated that there will be extensive consultation conducted before legislation is drafted and that the general public will get to decide what the voice will be. Earlier on the same day, the Prime Minister outlined that the Australian Parliament would decide what the voice will look like after the referendum. On behalf of all Australians, can the minister please clarify who is correct, the Prime Minister or Minister Burney? Thank you, Senator. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much. And again, I think the approach that the Prime Minister has made is around consulting and consulting widely. That work uh, needs to be undertaken. Um, minister Burney will be leading that along with Senator Dodson. Uh, and obviously there will be a, a, a mechanism for the voice, uh, but we are not uh, determining that ourselves for too long. Um, policies have been imposed rather than developed, and that is the work that needs to be done now. There is no point, uh, and we won't play the game of dividing people based on certain quotes that I haven't, haven't heard. This is, a, this is a process where we would like to work together to reach across the chamber, to hear different views, to have that fed back in. We understand there isn't unanimous agreement even in this parliament, let alone outside the parliament. So let's work together to deliver a magnificent outcome for this country. Thank you, Minister Gallagher. Senator Nampajinka Price, second supplementary. Thank you. Domestic, family and sexual violence is now in the Northern Territory 64 per cent higher than 2016. How will The Voice practically change this statistic? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President. And I think this is the debate about whether it's uh, an argument about symbolism versus practicality and practical implementation of policies. We would say that we need both, um, that you have um, recognition of the oldest continuous culture in, in the planet, recognised in our constitution, but at the same time that you implement uh, and improve through consulting rather than imposing and bringing people together the policies that are designed to support First Nations people, that we do both and that they are interlinked. That is the whole point. That is the whole point. It's not one or the other. There is a universal agreement that we need to see improvements 
for First Nations people in a whole range of areas, in health, in education, in jobs, in economic security, housing, uh, community safety, all of that. But that doesn't mean Thank we you, should Minister walk away Gallagher, from this opportunity. Order. Senator Thorpe. Senator Thorpe. Order. Senator Thorpe, when I call you to order, I expect you to stop shouting out. Senator Lambie or Senator Tyrrell Hopcock? Senator Lambie, thank you. Yeah, sorry, Madam President. Um, my question is for Minister representing the Minister of Financial Services, Senator Gallagher. Minister, right now superannuation managers can only spend their members' money to support their members' financial wellbeing. I would have thought that's just basic common sense, but somehow Labor doesn't agree. Don't you care if directors spend Australians' retirement money on stuff they don't need? We know they'll go back to paying for flashy corporate retreats and news websites like they were doing before we changed the laws. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister Gallagher. Uh, President, I missed the first part of the question. So could I, sorry, Thank Senator you. Lambie, I really couldn't hear it. Senator Lambie, please repeat the first part of your question. Thank you, uh, thank you um, Madam President. Minister, right now superannuation managers can only spend their members' money to support their members' financial wellbeing. I would have thought that's just basic common sense, but somehow Labor doesn't agree. Don't you care if directors spend Australians' retirement money on stuff they don't need? We know they'll go back to paying for flashy corporate retreats and news websites like they were doing before we changed the laws. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, Madam President. I, I will have to come back uh, to Senator Lambie on that question. I'm sorry. I, I would want detail before I provide an answer to the chamber. I don't want to be incorrect and have to come back and correct the record, but my apologies. Senator Lambie, first supplementary. Um, thank you, Madam President. Everybody knows super managers make, make donations to political parties and industry groups which I bet many members do not know and which I do not like, but at least they have to tell members who they're donating to and how much they're giving them. Why is Labor proposing to change that? Aren't you guys supposed to be about transparency? That's what you sold during your election. Or do you only care about transparency when you're trying to win elections? Thank you, Senator Lambie. A Minister no, Gallagher. we are a big supporter of transparency. Um, Madam President, and we'll be a lot more transparent than those opposite have ever been in a whole range of areas. As to the detail, I will come back to Senator Lambie with an answer. Senator Lambie, second supplementary. Order. Order. I don't believe Senator Lambie has been interjecting when you've answered que asked questions, and I would ask you to give her that same respect. Second supplementary, Senator Lambie. Um, thank you, Madam President. Labor says the changes are about reducing complexity for directors, but directors still have to tell members how much they spend on donations, just not where the donation money is going to. Won't that mean they'll have to keep those records anyway? Isn't this really just about hiding super money going to Labor and the unions? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister Gallagher. Um, well, the answer to that is no. Thank you. Uh, Senator O'Neill. Senator, uh, order. Senator O'Neill. Thank you, uh, President. And my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Skills and Training, Senator Watt. According to the OECD, Australia is experiencing the second most severe labour shortage in the developed world. Can the minister update the Senate on the government's progress in implementing the, its commitment to hold a Jobs and Skills Summit and outline what measures the Albanese government has already taken to address skills shortage? Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Minister Watt. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. I think I know this is an issue you've worked on for many years, particularly in your committee roles. As every employer and worker in Australia knows, our country is facing a skill shortage crisis. This is the workplace legacy of a decade of training cuts and inaction from an incompetent coalition government. And projections are that nine out of every 10 new jobs over the next five years will need a post-school qualification, heightening the need for Order. greater investment in our training system. 
the failure of the former government, which they are really upset to be reminded of, to invest in skills is one of the key causes of our economy's capacity constraints and the higher inflation that's resulted. And that's why the Albanese Labor government is taking action right now. The Jobs and Skills Summit in September is part of delivering on our election promise to bring people together, something the last government was incapable of doing, and find common ground on some of our tough economic challenges. Of course, as Senator Gallagher has pointed out, we have inherited a budget with a trillion dollars in debt, so the government will ensure that any measures taken will provide a good economic return. Australians voted in May for a government that looks ahead and makes real plans for the future, so we can shape our future instead of just reacting to events and missing opportunities, something that we had to endure nearly 10 years of from those opposite. We know a lot of Australians are doing it tough, so a key focus of the summit will be how we can improve lives and livelihoods, raising incomes, creating good jobs and getting Australians the skills they need for the jobs of tomorrow. The summit will bring Australians together, including employers, unions, civil society and governments, to address our shared economic challenges. We need all sorts of skills in our country, whether they be traditional or new skills, and it's this government's actions, including the Jobs and Skills Summit, which will be good for jobs. Thank you, Minister. Good what? Your time has expired. Um, Senator O'Neill, first supplementary. And I have to say that's the most satisfying answer I've received in the entire time I've been in this chamber. <laughs> Can, can, the minister, can the minister advise the Senate uh, why it is important to hold Senator this job? Senator please resume your seat. You need to be able to answer your question uh, with, it, with quiet. Senator O'Neill. Thank you, um, Senator Watt. Can the minister advise the Senate why it is important to hold this Jobs and Skills Summit? Minister Watt. Senator O'Neill, I aim to please with my answers and I'll try and please you with this new one as well. The Albanese government took office at a time of rising inflation and interest rates, falling real wages and a trillion dollars of debt, uh, which is now more expensive to service. Now, it really does take some effort for a government to deliver at the same time falling wages and a skill shortage, because of course economic theory, orthodox economic theory, would suggest that if you have a skill shortage, rate wage wages would go, would go up. But at a time of skill shortages in this country, this ex-government ex sent them down. We know a lot of Australians are doing it tough, so a key focus of the Jobs and Skills Summit will be how we improve lives and livelihoods, raising incomes, creating good jobs, and getting Australians the skills they need Senator for McGrath. the jobs of tomorrow. Delivering the skills that our employers, our workers and our economy needs is a key step towards growing our economic capacity and dampening inflationary pressures. That's why the Albanese Thank you, government Minister. is hitting While the ground running on this. Expired, Senator O'Neill, second supplementary. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Minister. And it's nice to get an answer full of hope and opportunity. Minister, what are the risks to the current skills shortage crisis? if we don't have a government committed to investing in and reforming the skills and, sc and training sector? Minister Watt. Thank you again, Senator O'Neill. Well, unfortunately, after a decade of training cuts and inaction, we are now experiencing a coalition-led skill shortage crisis. A situation made worse by the previous government's decision to abandon migrant workers Minister during Watt, pandemic— Minister Watt, seat. Minister Watt. Thank you, Madam President. I remember by week two it was starting to sink in for me as well, so I can understand the reaction that we've had this week. This situation of curse was made worse by the previous government's decision to abandon migrant workers during pandemic lockdowns, heightening the skill shortages that we saw across industries. And it's also true that the previous government failed to make an agreement with the state and territory governments on skills funding. Not one state or territory government signed up to the previous government's approach, whether they were Liberal or Labor or Coalition. So it's no surprise when the previous government neglected TAFEs, the lifeblood of the vocational education and training system, and failed to do the work needed for our skills sector. Unlike the former government, we're hitting the ground running, we're taking responsibility. Minister White, and we're your time has expired. Please resume your seat. Minister Wong. That was the Order. last one, wasn't it? I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Thank you. Uh, and while I'm on my free feet, if I may, uh, yesterday in question time, in response to a question from Senator Thorpe, 
I undertook to get some further information, if it were available, about the process of design for Makarata Commission. I have written to Senator Thorpe. There is uh, little additional to add to the answer, but given I gave the undertaking, I seek leave to ta I table my response to Senator Thorpe. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Deputy President, I rise to take note of answers from Senator Gallagher. Uh, Deputy President, once again we've seen today from the Labor Party a severe lack of economic literacy. We've seen again, following on the theme this week, that they have no idea as to how to tackle the cost of living crisis in this country. We have seen severe impacts on the price of groceries. Obviously, we have seen huge increases to the cost of fuel. Uh, we have seen massive increases to people's mortgage repayments. And Labor is basically saying, well, wait till the budget, wait till October. We we're not going to do anything about it till October. You know, we're, we're a fiscally responsible government, honestly, but you know, we don't have anything to do now to help Australians. We're going to wait till October. So I think quite rightly the Australian people would be watching closely. They'd be watching this government very closely, and they would be starting to worry that they're actually is no plan, that there is no plan to tackle the inflationary pressures in our economy. There is no plan to tackle the cost of living pressures faced by Australian families. Uh, particularly uh, in my constituency, the, everything outside the city I love to talk about uh, in regional areas, the cost of fuel alone, the cost of fuel alone is such a significant pressure. Families who now have to make a decision as to whether to continue the Saturday morning football, the Saturday morning football, because the cost of driving the car to practice and then to the game on the weekend is simply too much for the household budget. This is not necessarily something that will affect those in this place. Certainly won't affect the union officials who are advising this government, but it does affect families out there, whether it's in suburbia, whether it's in outer metro Australia, whether it's in regional Australia. These pressures are very real. And 6.1 per cent is the, is the headline number, but everyone out there who does the weekly grocery shopping knows that the costs, pressures, particularly on groceries, are seemingly much higher than that. Uh, you, you are seeing extraordinary pressure uh, on household budgets in terms of balancing the books, making sure people can get through the week, making sure they can do those extra things that they want to for their kids. And we see again today that we have a government with no plan, no strategy to help Australian families now. Wait till October is the answer. Where responsible. Well, you will be responsible. You'll be responsible for an awful lot of economic pain unless you get these settings right. As the Leader of the Opposition, uh, the Honourable Peter Dutton, in the other place said, Australia, the Australian economy needs a very finely balanced response. The government needs to provide a very finely balanced response. We have to protect Australian families for cost of living pressures and a wage price spiral. This government needs to be able to deal with both sides of the issue, and it is a test of leadership for this Prime Minister. And instead, we have Jim Chalmers talking about putting 
a union rep on the board of the RBA. How is that, how is that going to help? How, how is that going to help? How is that going to help the Australian families who are struggling to make ends meet, Senator O'Neill? How is that going to help the Australian families who are make, struggling to make ends meet? Now, I, those opposite, those opposite care Order more right. about putting a union official on the board of the RBA than they do about balancing families' budgets. And the interjections from those opposite just shows that. Just shows that. That you care, you don't arc up until I mention the union rep on the RBA. And then you arc up, don't you? I mean, you, goodness Senator gracious. Senator Steele. Mr. President, thank you so much. You know, I sat there and thought today, how many gifts from heaven can fall in my lap today? Well, Senator Brockman, you damn beauty. Thank you so much, dear Lord. I'm coming back. You want to talk about the price of cost, uh, the increasing costs of, of living? Don't go. Don't go. Come back, Senator Brockman. I've got respect for you. It's just that you do mix with some strange people. I'll give you four words. Josh. Frydenberg. I'll give you another two. Scott Morrison. You want to talk about the cost of living? I'll tell you what happened. Let's cast our mind back to uh, uh, mid-May, when those two geniuses of the Liberal Party thought it was a fantastic idea, anything it took to win a vote. So how can we con people that, 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 that they should vote for us again, even though we've been absolutely incompetent and done five-eighths of nothing? Oh, uh, Senator no, Fawcett, Senator Fawcett, you're uh, better me, Senator than this. I haven't uh, even Senator started. Senator Fawcett has a point of order. Po point of order, Deputy President. My good friend Senator Stirl would understand Standing Order 193, subpara 3, that imputations of improper motives are not in order. I'd ask you to reflect on your comments, Senator Stirl, and restrain yourself where you sail close to the standing orders. Oh, for, you, for you, Mr Acting Deputy President, it would be my privilege. For my good friend, Senator Fawcett, there's my second gift from heaven. Lord, this is getting better. I'm coming back. And when they thought that it was a great idea in the dark of night to slash the diesel fuel credits from the transport industry, from the road transport industry and from the agricultural industry. Now, anyone with half a peanut in their head would understand where I'm going on this one. So our truckies and our agriculture industry get 17.8 cents, and Senator Brockman, I wish you were still here, 17.8 cents per litre to claim back every three months in their bass. Guess what happened? There was not a 22 per cent reduction in, in diesel costs because they stole the 17.8 diesel fuel credits from the road transport industry and the agricultural industry. And I'll tell you what happened. All they got, the truckies, was a four cent a litre reprise or reprisal, whatever the word is. But I've got to tell you, in the last 12 months, I know because I sit at the bowels of fueling up trucks in my part time. It's a fun thing. You should. Right. The whole lot of you should try it. When I watch diesel go from $1.50 a litre to $2.40 a litre, don't worry about the rip off of the 17.8 cents. There's all that cost of diesel going too. So, what actually happens in the real world, a lot of the big boys, the big operators, they have the ability, because when they negotiate their contracts, they have what are called fuel levies. I'm not going to insult your intelligence, Senators, because you are the three smartest ones on that side. I'll give you that. You know exactly what I'm talking about. The majority of the transport, no three, let's leave it at three, Matt, you and I, mates, let's keep it that way. Now, the majority of the transport industry, so there's about 70 per cent of the road transport industry that is mum and dad businesses, small to medium enterprise, so, so, so to speak, who, who, who have no ability to negotiate the fuel levy. And you wonder why, oh gee whiz, I can't believe, can I ask for an extension of time please, Mr Acting Deputy President, I'll go for an hour on this. That's underwater with a gob full of marbles. Who do not have the ability to put the cost back onto their costs. So you wonder why we see 10 cents a litre, uh, t uh, sorry, 10, <laughs> 10 dollar iceberg lettuces. The cost of transport, road transport and agriculture has gone through the roof. Scott Morrison, Josh Frydenberg. And you know the worst part about this? Not one of you said a damn thing. You know damn well it was the wrong, 
thing. You knew it was just so uh, criminal to allow your previous Prime Minister and Treasurer to try and con the people of Australia. But the worst part is it did me another favour. Another, another prize of present fell in my lap because they absolutely disrespected the road transport industry. And the only thing that saved them is the, is, is, is the the complete incompetence of the Australian Trucking Association, which I do rightfully call it the Canberra branch of the National Party. They don't represent the transport industry, but they weren't going to say anything to their nat and lib mates. Well, I've got to tell you, thank goodness that everyone else rose their voices. Kid you not, you brag about saving 22 cents a litre for the average family car, and for some families that would make a difference, absolutely. But for the $13 extra that they saved on the Hyundai that got fueled up once a week, put another nearly $30 in the cost of groceries at Woolworths, Coles and other stores, and you think that's good mathematics? And the good burgers of Australia woke up to you, because I couldn't wait to tell every single Australian who was listening what Josh Frydenberg and Scott Morrison pulled over over their eyes, while sadly the rest of you just sat there like lemmings going over the edge of the cliff. Well, guess what? It's still a major problem. The trucking industry and the agriculture industry is not the Commonwealth or the, the Bank of Australia. You've paid for your sins. But well, I'll tell you what, some of you, and not you three good ones over there, the rest of you and that side over there, how you look in the mirror or how they look in the mirror at night and think that they've been a great representative of their communities. See how we go when the small family businesses come to you in tears because their business has gone Thank you, Senator Stirl. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Uh, I too rise to take note of answers by Senator Gallagher and supported by her ministerial counterpart, uh, Senator Watt. Uh, with your Scottish surname, I'll start off with this. Um, the concept of history being written is often attributed to Winston Churchill, but in actual fact, uh, it is traced back to the 1746 of the Battle of Culloden in Scotland, where one of the clan leaders lamented he didn't know how many members of his clan died on the battlefield because it's the victor who writes the history and counts the dead. And can I say, Deputy President, today we have seen a lot of that in this place. Almost every second sentence in the answers that have been provided is about what was inherited or the former government and talking about the need to recreate and reinvest in things that are claimed to have uh, been a failure. The test that the Treasurer, who Senator Gallagher represents, uh, held out for himself about the success of their government was what happens to power prices, what happens with apprentices and manufacturing and what happens with wages. And so there's been a lot of talk about training and manufacturing and skills uh, in this question time. I think it's really important to place on the record the fact that last year, in the last full year of the coalition government under Prime Minister Scott Morrison, there was a record $6.4 billion in skills and investment. We actually had the most apprentices in training since record began in 1963. Let me just repeat that. The most apprentices in training since records began in 1963. And part of the reason for that is because of the strategic investments that the Morrison government made in areas of manufacturing. And so we had the Modern Manufacturing Initiative and Fund, which sought to identify those areas which were critical to Australia's security and Australia's future. Now that went to important areas such as defence, space, medical goods, supply chain resilience, critical minerals, the things that the world has identified, particularly during the period of COVID, are critical to a nation's security. And we have seen not only the government funding that has gone into those programs, but co-investment from industry, which has led to some of the great outcomes in terms of the numbers of people in training, but has also led to things like the unemployment rate being down at 3.9 per cent and decreasing. So to go to Senator Gallagher and her representing the Treasurer and the test that he has set, where he said the test is what happens with manufacturing and apprentices, unlike the coalition, who worked with industry to invest in more productive capacity, which led them to invest, to employ people, to train people around apprentices, we see a talk fest. The plan from the Labor government 
is a talk fest. That's what their plan is on skills. And when it comes to manufacturing, for those who read The Australian on the 24th of July, there was quite a substantive article expressing concerns which I have heard on the ground from people within both the space and the defence sector. That the razor gang within the Albanese government, as they seek to find savings ahead of the budget, have actually put a pause on the modern manufacturing grants, which means that companies who have invested, who have employed, who have started to train people, are now expressing concern to me and were expressing concern to the journalist who wrote the article that these projects which underpin Australia's sovereignty, our security, our supply chain resilience are now in doubt. So manufacturing has actually been stalled by the Albanese government. And so as the Australian public consider these first couple of months of the government, they should compare the positive investment that led to new jobs, new innovation, training for our children and future generations versus a talk fest and a razor gang that has put all of those investments at doubt. And the Australian public, I think, in time will realise that those people who have chosen to rewrite history in actual fact have no real plan to create a future. Senator O'Neill. Deputy President, and uh, I, I rise with pleasure to refute some of the nonsense that we have heard in the contributions from those who are speaking for the opposition today. And they may rail at the answers that they're receiving, but the reality is they're on the end of a bit of truth telling. After nine years of deception and a a thimble and pea tricks that have populated this government's action, Australian people know it's hurting. I talk to people in the retail sector very, very frequently. People are now finding it really hard when they get to the checkout to make ends meet. And that is because when we came into government and with not only a trillion dollars in debt, this government has left this country in a state where we found we have rising inflation, rising interest rates, supply chain disruption, as Senator Gallagher indicated, no investment in skills and an energy market that is in crisis. That's the reality of what nine years of the former government delivered. And yet they come in here and act as if they gave Australians a great experience and they left us all fine. It's a joke. It's like when, you, when you've got kids and they're about seven or eight and, they, and you say, oh, go in and tidy up your room, you know, and they just stuff everything under the doona cover and pull the lid over the top and pretend it's not there. Well, that's the equivalent of the 23rd energy policy of, of uh, Minister Hume. Right? He had 22 goes at trying to deliver some policies. No market certainty. No wonder smart people weren't putting their money behind this government because they couldn't tell which way they were going to turn any day. They had no solution. So he brings out the doona and puts it over four days before the election. Can't tell the truth throw the doona over it just so the Australian people don't know that there's been a 19 per cent increase in energy, because they'll never figure it out. The contempt for the Australian people that is manifest in the questions that are being asked by this opposition and by their responses, which absolutely fail in a court that looks at fact. And that's what Australian families are faced with, the fact that inflation delivered by the policies of this government is making it harder for them. The fact that they had to pay through the nose for training. The fact that this government didn't tell them the truth on so many occasions, so many occasions, so contemptuous of the Australian people were the former government that Minister Taylor thought it was okay to cover up a massive increase in the cost of energy that was going to flow through into the, the economies of each of the families of this country. And that is why they lost the election. Because in the end, you can only put the doona over it for so long. And the adults have to come in. Maturity has to enter. Proper conversations have to be had. Now, this afternoon, 
Those in the opposition have characterised the skills and training forum that's going to be held, a national forum to deal with the fact that we haven't got enough workers for our small businesses to actually operate effectively. They want to call it a talk fest. They don't know anything about talking. If they actually had talked properly into the Australian people, they would have come up with policies that wouldn't have landed us with the situation that we find ourselves in, with rising inflation, with a trillion dollars in debt, with supply chain disruption. All of that is because of their failure to have authentic conversations, real conversations about what mattered to this country. So it's a bit rich when they come in here and start trying to run a line that there's no plan. There's plenty of plan. There was a plan that we took to the election. There's a plan that enlivened the vision of Australians for a better future for themselves and their children, for small businesses for people who want to get training, for people who want to employ people who get training. We have a plan and we've begun to implement it already with the legislation that's been brought into this place. Now, those opposite don't like it and they are attempting in this first period of our being in this place to rewrite history, to absolve themselves of the sins of their failures in public policy. And nowhere is that more evident than in the hip pocket pain of every business of every household that is suffering the consequences of years and years of neglect in dealing with the energy reality of Australia. They should Thank not be attended to. They failed the nation. They're on the correct side of the chamber. Senator Scar. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to take note of answers given by Senator Gallagher uh, to my friend Senator Brockman. Um, in relation to Senator Stirl's contribution, I'd, I'd like to make some preliminary comments. And I think uh, it is important that everyone is aware of the fact, uh, including those who join us in the gallery, that Senator Stirl does an outstanding job uh, delivering uh, household items, furniture to those in need in remote places of, uh, of Western Australia. And, and I commend Senator Stirl on it. And to the extent, mate, that the prices have gone up on diesel, I'm happy to kick in. So, um, so I'd just like to make those comments in relation to Senator Stirl. Uh, but the rea reality is, the reality is, there are cost of living pressures which are being faced by Australians all over this country. And the question is, what is going to happen? What is going to happen when those Australians go to fill up their cars after the diesel fuel excise rebate was cut by by half? What is going to happen to those Australian when the, Australians when the fuel excise uh, being cut in half is reversed, comes to an end, comes to an end in September? What are they going to do? And we are starting to hear stories now, and I heard more stories today of parents, especially in some of our more challenged socio-economic areas, who are now making choices. Are now making choices. Do I use that petrol in my car? to do the shopping to go to work, or do I use it to take my son or daughter to sport or participate in all sorts of events that every child in this country has a right to expect they should have an opportunity to participate in? So the question is, what is the government going to do? What is the government going to do to practically, to practically take action to confront those cost of living, price, uh, cost of living pressures? The reality is, that in the last budget, 2022-23, brought down by the former government, on page nine, under budget priorities, page nine under budget priorities was addressing cost of living pressures and managing current changes through, and I quote, a temporary and targeted cost of living package, including a $420 cost of living tax offset for low and middle income earners. That's what we did in government. That's what we did in government. What is the new government going to do? What is their plan? A $250 cost of living payment for eligible Australian pensioners, welfare recipients, veterans and concession cardholders. $250 in the pocket of all those pensioners and welfare recipients. That was the former government's plan. That's what we did in government. What is the new government going to do? What is their plan? These are reasonable questions that should be asked in this place. What is your plan? Again, I know I've talked about the 50 per cent reduction in petrol and diesel excise 
an excise equivalent customs duty for six months that will deliver an average benefit of around $300 to households with at least one vehicle. That was our plan, introduced and delivered, delivered at every petrol bowser across this, state, across this country. What is the government's plan? What are they going to do when that policy runs out within the six-month period in September? What are they going to do? Because Australians all over this country are going to be confronted with that additional 22 cents a litre every time they go to fill up their car. What is the government's plan? We do not know. There is no plan. And these are legitimate answers which are being asked by the opposition, as is our responsibility as an opposition in this place. And then there's the question. There's the question today, just today, interest rates have gone up. The cash rate is now at 1.85 per cent. 1.85 per cent. It isn't since 1994, 1994 during the Hawke Keating years, that we've had four consecutive interest rate increases in four consecutive months. You've got to go all the way back to 1994 was the last time that happened. What is the government's plan to address cost of living pressures? Because Australians are being hit from all sides. They're being hit from all sides in terms of fuel prices, grocery prices, rental, uh, rents are increasing, uh, interest rates. They're being hit from all sides. All sides. I mean, certainly um, during my time in this place, I haven't seen this sort of uh, conflation of all these factors occurring at the same time, hitting Australians in their back pocket. What is the government going to do? What is your plan? Thank you, Senator Scar. I put the question on the motion moved by Senator Brockman. Those for the question say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, to you uh, Deputy President. I uh, move that the Senate uh, take note of the response given by uh, Senator Gallagher to the question I asked uh, in question time. And, uh, the question, of course, was focused around um, interest rates. And, uh, as we've just heard, uh, the Reserve Bank has just lifted rates again by, uh, by 50 basis points. And interestingly, uh, we heard last month the governor of the Reserve Bank uh, basically jawboning down wages, uh, saying he didn't want to see um, wages over uh, a particular level. But uh, no matter how hard I listened and many other Australians listened, what we didn't hear was the governor of the Reserve Bank jawboning down um, corporate profits. Uh, that's something that we didn't hear, but we did hear him jawboning down wages. Now, um, the problem that we've got. Uh, is that uh, we haven't heard uh, anything of that nature from the Governor of the Reserve Bank, but we also uh, haven't heard anything of that nature from this government. And uh, we didn't hear uh, the Treasurer, Dr Chalmers, in his statement to the House last week, uh, neglected to mention the role that corporate profiteering is happen having on um, putting upwards pressure on inflation in this country, and despite being asked uh, repeatedly by me in this place, the, the finance minister, uh, the minister representing the treasurer, uh, Senator Gallagher, uh, has also not acknowledged uh, the role that corporate profiteering is playing on um, putting upwards pressure on interest rates. And I want to be clear that the Greens do acknowledge uh, some of the supply side. Uh, issues that, uh, that are contributing to inflation. Um, uh, that includes um, things like um, supply chain issues, pandemic, um, war, uh, climate change, although we don't give this government a free pass on climate change because, let us not forget, they are one of the most fossil fuel addicted governments in the world. But we do acknowledge those supply side shocks, but we want to hear the government start to acknowledge the role that corporate profiteering is playing. Um, there's been a class war underway in this country for 40 years since Hawke and Keating turbocharged neoliberalism in the mid 1980s, and it is absolutely unarguable that the rich, the billionaire class, are winning that war. You only have to look at what happened during the first two years of the pandemic. Billionaires stupendously and obscenely increased their wealth as corporate profits went through the roof. 
and it's this corporate profiteering that is helping pushing helping to push the price of things up it's the perfect but terrible storm for working people because wages are going backwards in real terms workers pay packets are shrinking in real terms just as everything else is getting more expensive. And now you've got the RBA coming in over the top, jacking up rates. And who's going to feel the pain? Not the billionaires, not the super wealthy, not the corporations or most of their shareholders, not on your life. It's not those people, it's not the politicians, all of us in here earning hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Because remember, Labor's promised we're all going to get a big fat tax cut with the stage three income tax cuts. And we're going to get looked after $240 billion of expenditure that Labor is committed to that will deliver nothing, literally nothing, to someone on the minimum wage. But we'll all get a big fat real pay rise. The people that are going to get hurt are the people who can't afford to buy political outcomes. Recent home buyers who paid the highest price in history for their new homes, lulled by a reserve bank who told them there'd be no interest rate rises for another two years. It's renters, many of whom are already stretched to or beyond breaking point, who'll have to suck up again another rent rise, rise to pay off their landlord, landlord's mortgage. There is a better way. Introduce a corporate super profits tax address some of that corporate profiteering, help tackle inflation, but use the revenue to help tackle the cost of living crisis. Put dental into Medicare, put mental health into Medicare, provide free childcare, start looking after the environment that ultimately sustains us all. By treating housing as a human right and not as an investment class, we can ensure that no one has to worry about the basic right of shelter in this country and we could help people who are so terribly feeling the pain at the moment. Thank you, Senator McKimmett. I've put the motion. Those are the questions say aye, against no, the ayes have it.